Thank you. On the show tonight, showbiz legend Elaine Stritch, then one of the best singers in the business, on her way to becoming an all-time great Diana Krall. Then, two interviewers, one who reduces politicians to rubble, Jeremy Paxman. The other would qualify as the most useless of all time. He's one of the funniest characters in modern television comedy. Sail away, sail away, sail away. <laughs> sail away, sail away. <coughs> oh, that's right. It's right, I'm not saying you. <laughs> uh, pump number three. Good pump. <laughs> F. Raphael. Yeah. That's funny, I used to have a teacher at school called uh, Frank Raphael. Yeah. Sweaty Raphael, we used to call him. Yeah. <laughs> Great big sweating stains under his armpits. I've just realised it's you. How the devil are you? The character Alan Partridge. Welcome, please, its creator, Steve Coogan. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Bring us up to date on uh, Mr. Partridge. Well, he's no longer living in a travel tavern. Uh, he's, now <laughs> he's now living in a static home. <laughs> not, not a caravan. No. A static home. A static There's home. a difference. Yes. Um, uh, next to his house, which is being built. And, and his job uh, now? Uh, his job. He's still working on the radio. He's oh. got a slightly better slot, uh -huh. so things are going okay. Yes. He has a girlfriend. <laughs> he has a Ukrainian girlfriend. <laughs> He didn't meet her on the internet. <laughs> he's also, he's, uh, he's got a, he's branched out, he's on uh, digital TV now, of course. He's got he? a digital TV uh, military-based quiz show called Skirmish, <laughs> uh, which no one's ever seen. <laughs> and we don't, in fact, we don't even see it in the series. You know. He has to tell people how to find it. You know. and, and he's also, of course, branched out into, into video now, hasn't he? He, uh, he does, he does uh, what they call cheap sell-through videos. Um, mainly lots of car crashes uh, linked together by Alan. Uh, uh, the, the one out at the moment is called Crash Bang Wallet What a Video. <laughs> is it a re reputable firm of video makers? Um, they also do uh, very sort of uh, uh, dodgy videos like um, uh, the Boob Olympics <laughs> and, uh, and, and other sort of uh, wet t shirt competitions, that kind of Good. thing. Yes. Very right. reputable company. Yes, well, I, I wanted you to set that up because, in fact, the clip we've got from the new series, which starts on Monday, this coming Monday. Uh, is, is of Alan actually meeting his producer uh, at the country club and, uh, and having words with her. And this is an example of, of what he thinks is, is funny and reasonable. Mm. Mm. Let's have a look. Hi! Oh, Alan! Just mm. stay down. <laughs> uh, sorry I'm late, sir. Uh, had to have a shower. Got a bit clammy. Uh, just a <laughs> How have you been, Ellen? Ruddy bloody good, actually. <laughs> yes, his panic attacks have all but stopped. <laughs> Thanks, then. Oh, Hello, excuse me, what's his name? It's Todd. What, Todd, seriously? <laughs> Hello, Todd. Hello. Hey, snazzy jeans you got on there? Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, there is a zero tolerance policy on denim in the bar. Yes. Uh, I think there's a chap over there I I wearing jeans. <laughs> a chap of about six. Right. Uh, they're lovely at that age, aren't they? <laughs> they get you on the old jeans rule. <laughs> Nazis. <laughs> but with excellent facilities. As have the Nazis. <laughs> It's interesting, Alan, because uh, in that character, I mean, you challenge the sound of kind of limits, the parameters of humour, don't you? Mm, mm. I mean, there was one I remember where, I mean, you actually he hit a man in a wheelchair. He did hit a man in a wheelchair. Yeah. And that sounds very reprehensible. In fact, it is reprehensible. I would never, ever recommend hitting people in wheelchairs. I think it's a very bad thing. Um, but uh, we just thought, what, what, we, we sometimes think, what's, what's the worst possible thing you could do? How, can, can we put it in a comedy and get away with it and make it funny? Because it's Alan doing it, then it's all right. Because so, you're laughing at Alan, you're not laughing at the person in the wheelchair. Mm. But it's, um, it's always nice to sort of 
do things that people feel a bit uncomfortable about. A lot of people actually sort of watch the programme, they go, I sometimes meet husbands and wives and they say, that, they, they say, oh, my husband loves it, but I can't stand it, it's awful, I can't watch it. Yes. You know? And that's a lot of people feel that, they feel it's very uncomfortable to watch. But I, think, uh, I think good comedy is like that. That's a compliment, you think? I think so, yeah. I mean, well, but he didn't start off like that. I mean, now he's fully fledged. Now he's, he's developed into a, into mm. a, into a, a character with a, with a, with a, a kind of a soul and, and all that sort of thing. Well, how did he start off? He was a sports contest. Yeah. I knew nothing about sports, and I still still don't, I still know very little. Um, but uh, so I just make things. I just I just make things up. Like if I was watching, they'd give me some uh, 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 some footage of, of a football match, and I wouldn't know who was playing or, or who they were. And I'd just start talking rubbish, actually, saying things like, "There goes the man with the ball there, passing it to the the other man, the one with the curly hair, <laughs> and uh, he's kicked it in the net, and that's a goal." Um, <laughs> And you just, you, just, you just talk. It's verbal diarrhoea, but, uh, uh, you know, th there are a lot of um, broadcasters, um, present company accepted, who, <laughs> who, do, who do talk a lot of verbal diarrhoea, but they say it with such confidence that they kind of get away with it. You know, yeah. they, they, I think that the, the attitude is, keep talking, it doesn't matter what you're saying. Yeah. But you're talking about present company accepted, I mean, how did he become a talk show host? And, and dare I ask this question, who was he modelled on? Well... <laughs> <laughs> Now you tell the truth. Uh, well, uh, the if you tell the truth, you've got one minute left. If you don't tell the truth, <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, he, he was he, he was sort of an amalgam of lots of people. Um, but he's but um, funnily enough, since since he's since I started doing him, it's it's more after the event watching broadcasters that I start to think, God, you know, he's just like he's he's worse than Alan Partridge. I mean, um, oh, go on. <laughs> Sure. Um, well, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of Richard Maglin, I think. Is there? <laughs> I think a little, a, a what, a little which bit of Richard Maglin? Um, the, the bits where Richard Maglin sort of puts his foot in it, which is, uh, which is most of him, I think. <laughs> <laughs> like, like the, this autobiography, what is it about? That kind of question. Yeah, yeah, it's that, yeah. <laughs> But what about, you see, what's interesting about you is that the, the, the voices of place are an important part of you. I mean, you are now, you are an actor, basically. That was your ambition. That's what you wanted to be. But the, your, your facility with voices led you into, well, in fact, gave you your career because your equity card you gained by actually well, yeah. doing voices, didn't well, you? Well, I went to drama school when I did all that thing of pretending to be a tree and, uh, <coughs> and pretending to be a fried breakfast and wearing tights and dancing around, and that was all very useful stuff. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> But no, the, the, but when I was there, to, in those days, to become an actor, you had to get an equity card. And the only, the, one of the few ways of doing it was doing cabaret. And uh, so I, I did... Um, and I could do impressions, so I just started doing stand-up comedy around pubs and clubs. And that was my, the, the way I got my card. And I was able to do... I had a facility for doing voices. I'd do, you know... I'd do, I'd do, I'd do people like Ronnie Corbett in, uh, um, and, uh, you know, I'd... I'd <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd do him like that, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'd, but I'd do him, the, I'd, I'd put him in Vietnam, you know. I'd, I'd, I'd do him as a kind of the ter Terminator in Vietnam, going, you know. <laughs> there I was, you know, surrounded by gooks. <laughs> you know, out from the bushes. <laughs> I blew him away. <laughs> Which isn't very nice. <laughs> I, I, used to, I, used to, I just used to do all these kind of voices, and, and uh, so that was... I, I started getting voiceover work, you know, doing those adverts, doing those things like, Get down to Top Man today! Horrible acrylic sweaters, only three ninety nine. Horrible colours for tassels, only forty ninety nine. It's all gonna go, so hurry, hurry, hurry. <laughs> I, I, I do stuff like that. And, and, um, and the work, the, but I, I didn't really like doing it. It was just a way of sort of paying the rent, really, until I sort of established myself. But um, you'd, you'd end up doing the, the, the worst kind of voiceover to do was, was because I'm a northerner, what was quite odd was being asked to do what they call RP taglines. That's where you do like the end line of an advert. So you say things like, now there's even more for your money at Asta. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, do, I do stuff like that, but the worst thing was when some advertising copywriters had written what they thought was a funny sketch. And afterwards, you'd have to do the tagline, and they'd say, could you put a laugh in the voice? Just when you say the end line, so you go, now there's even more. For you. <laughs> <laughs> Not having found it remotely funny at all. <laughs> what was it, do you have any some embarrassing ones to do at all, in voiceovers? Oh, I was, I was the original Mr Muscle kitchen cleaner. Were you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I can see how impressed everyone is. <laughs> yeah, I was, the, I was Mr. Muscle Kitchen Cleaner, loves the jobs you hate. And uh, ever since then, I, I feel that um, my original Mr. Muscle Kitchen Cleaner has been, uh, has been uh, ripped off by uh, various actors after me, but I'm, I'm not better. You mentioned there that, <laughs> that you had this facility for, for, for voices. That was, what, presumably from childhood, was it? I remember when I was, in, in, uh, when I was uh, at home, uh, asleep in, in the bedroom with my brothers. I came from a big, big family. So I have, I have four brothers, and um, 
uh, most of us would sleep in this big bedroom, all these bunk beds, and I would wake up in the middle of the night and wake brother, my, my brother up and say, Kevin, Kevin, what, what? Does this sound like Norris McWhorter? It's <laughs> <laughs> at 4 a.m. Huh? Yeah, yeah, just like him. Go away. Because yeah. yours was a generation informed by television, of course, weren't you? I mean, television was the, was the formative influence. I think that's very important to me, that, because I grew up with television. It was, I used to, before video, I would uh, record Monty Python uh, and, and 40 Towers with a cassette recorder with a microphone pointed at the TV. <laughs> because there was no, and I'd just, so I'd just have an audio recording of a TV show and I'd play it back to friends. And, and during the visual bits, I'd sort of have to explain the visual bits, so I'd listen to it and go, he's going through a door now. <laughs> <laughs> he's sitting on a chair. OK, and then, you know, that, that, this, this, that, that, so I was very much into all that, and I'd, Monty Python and all the, the records, I'd listen to them, I'd memorise sketches. Well, what about the, the other inspirations that, that you've got? I mean, uh, Paul Carf, for instance. I mean, he was somebody that you met as a student, wasn't he? He was the kind of person who, who as a student, I'd find very... Uh, threatening. See, because I, I, because I was a student, I was kind of... Uh, you were a drama student. I really? was a drama student, and, but I did these, I did these summer jobs uh, where, where, you'd work, where you did casual labouring, and I worked in this chemical plant with these lads, and they all thought I was a bit soft, um, because at lunchtime they'd all be reading The Sun and playing cards, and I'd be reading The Guardian and doing the crossword, right? And they'd, say, they'd look across at me and go, what are you reading that for, eh, you great puff? <laughs> in The Guardian, and I'd, I'd laugh at some article by Hugo Young, Right, and I go, <laughs> and they go, what's so funny? <laughs> it's just something in the article. Huh? Well, I'll read it out. No, no, I don't think you'd find it funny. It's just some observation about the Conservative Party policy. <laughs> um, <laughs> is that funny? <laughs> um, and there was, I remember there was, there was one guy there who, who was actually, he works on this stacker truck, he was called Mick. And uh, he walked around with a fag in the corner of his mouth all day, like, <laughs> looking like death. Like, he wouldn't never, never look him straight in the eye. And I was... Uh, I was loading up this big barrel of linseed oil. Don't tell, ask me why, but I was. That was what I was asked to. And um, this lad next to me said, there's Mick coming along. He said, when he comes past, just to get in with the other lads, his, his grand had been knitting him a sweater for ages. He said, just, just when he comes past, say, is your grand finished knitting you that sweater? And I went, oh, OK, I'll, I'll be one of the lads then. And I went, hey, Mick, has your grand finished knitting that sweater? And he stopped the stack of truck and went, <coughs> you bastard. <laughs> she, she lost her arms in a milling machine. <laughs> He told me to say it. <laughs> he said, I'm going to have you, I'm going to have you at the end of work today. So the rest of the day I was sweating like this. And as I was going to sort of collect my cards, and at the end of the day he ran up to me, like, he ran straight up to me and he went, we had you there, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> did you ever get thumped? Uh, uh, so yes, I did, yeah, did I did you? get thumped, yeah. I got thumped, <laughs> yes, I did. Uh, usually outside the chip shop, isn't that normally where people get thumped? <laughs> uh, yeah, I did get thumped. I, I normally kind of... The one, the, the way, it, when I was with lads like that, the way I'd avoid getting hit was I could do impressions, and the one they knew was, was Sylvester Stallone. Oh. So they'd go, oh, do your Rocky. And I'd go, oh, I'm going to bust your ass now. <laughs> You're all right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what about the, I mean, Alan Party now, I mean, I suppose, in a sense, you're stuck with him, aren't you? I mean, not, not the, I mean, I mean that in the nicest sense, mm. that, you know, he's, he's part of the landscape now. He's, yeah. he's your most, most famous creation. And, and part of the, the catalogue of, of, of comedy characters. Is that a kind of imposition on you? I mean, are you going to struggle, do you think, to, to maintain him? Uh, well, it's fun, funnily enough, um, uh, it, it, it's strange because when I was a child, all I wanted to do was to... to one of my, I think one of my, my chief ambitions was to be able to make a sitcom as... Or, or create a comic character like Basil Forte or, or like Blackhand or something. That, that was what I wanted to do, and I sort of more or less achieve that now. And, and so it is an albatross, but it's a very nice albatross to have. Yes. And I, w I was saying to Armando Iannucci and Peter Bainham, who write the series sure. with me, I said to them, uh, I said, I've, I've come to terms with that fact now that it, it, whenever I die, if I die next year, if I die in 30 years, in my obituary there'll probably be a picture of Alan Partridge. <laughs> and Pete Bainham said, yeah, but in our obituaries there'll be a picture of Alan Partridge too. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but, but you, you're branched out in the sense you've got your own production company now and you've just finished doing a new comedy drama, haven't you? Yeah. And your, and your movie too, the, the last movie you did about the club scene in... 24-hour party, party people. Party. Yeah. But, uh, but I mean, that's gone down big in America. It's gone down very well in America because mm. they don't know who I am there. So no. they go, you know, they, and, they, and, and uh, the, the, the thing you were saying about Alan Partridge, of course, whatever I do gets compared with Alan Partridge. So if he doesn't quite match up to it, people say, oh, it's not as good as Partridge. Well, over there they don't know who he is. So they went, oh, there's a, quite a funny bloke in this new film. You know, he seems quite talented. Um, and uh, so that's quite refreshing that, that I was, the film was judged entirely on its merits. And so it's, it's opened a few doors for me. Good, there. which you're obviously you're going to go through. Well, yeah, the, the thing is, I, what they have in the, there's a kind of a ladder in America. There's a kind of a... A, what they call a casting list, and I'm on the bottom rung of that. So I get sent lots of scripts and saying, "Are you interested in playing this part?" And I go, "Oh yes, I'd love to." And they go, "Oh, sorry, someone else is doing it." 
Uh, sorry, Ben Stiller's doing it. You know, um, so there's all these people. So I've got to wait for all these people to say no yeah. before it gets to me. So I'm just, I'm just waiting. Really. And and um, shortly we shall be uh, joined on the set by by Mr. Jeremy Paxman. And of course, what I didn't mention about your career was that at one point you did Spitting Image, didn't you? And I'm right, I think, in saying that you did the the, the very first voice of Mr. Paxman. I did. You? I remember that because what they did when they have a new puppet, they have a new puppet of uh, Mr. Paxman um, in his slightly curlier hair days, and. Uh, and they, they sort of brought the puppet on and they said, okay, who can do a Paxman? So I went up and did my, uh, my, my version of him. And uh, I, what I did, I, I, I don't know if it's my imagination, but I, I coined this thing where when it, he'd, start, he'd respond to every politician's comment by, by going, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what if, you know, he'd sort of speak like this. It's all very well. A lot of people sort of think that's very interesting. <laughs> what exactly is it? You know, he just sort of points those words out like that. But, but, the, but I said, every time I sort of started, Ears. And after a while in the script, they started spelling it ears. E A R S. Ears. <laughs> well, we shall, we shall uh, test out, out that, that uh, invitation <laughs> when, he, when he comes on in just a moment. But uh, for the moment, Steve, we want to thank you very much indeed. Thank Steve. You.